By the time filtrate gets to the DCT, we're getting to the end of this thing because we went through filtration, PCT, the loop. Now this is the last part of the tube before it dumps into the collecting duct. We can still have a uh, filter that we can modify. By the time filtrate reaches here, most things have been identified. Um, so most things have been reabsorbed already. So basically, what's left in the filter? Not much. What's left in the filter? Two, reabsorb. Not much. Maybe some water and some salt. Okay. sodium ions. If you, I guess, want it, maybe you're dehydrated, then you want to reabsorb that water and salt. So you want to conserve your electrolytes and fluids if you're dehydrated. So then it comes into play, aldosterone. Aldosterone you know, review it, we, I taught this before, it's secreted from the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex. It targets the kidney tubules. It specifically targets the DCT, and it facilitates the uptake of sodium. We've done that before. Secreted from zona glomerulosa. <laughs> right in targets the DCT cells. Facilitates the uptake or reabsorption of sodium. detail, the reabsorption of sodium. Now water follows, usually if ADH is present, and you're still expected to know this slide, and um, it was presented to you in the endocrine chapter, so I don't want to like go through the steps again, but this is what you need to know in terms of um, what aldosterone does at the DCT cells, and so uh, emphasize here now, I didn't emphasize this before, but Specifically, it targets the DCT. Okay, before I just said it targets the kidney because you didn't know that detail yet. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much all I'll mention about the DCT. Aldosterone targets it to reabsorb some water and salt. Um, and then after that, the filtrate enters the collecting duct, which is the last possible place. You can modify the filtrate before it becomes urine. So you're looking at two cups of urine. And the reason why I show this picture is because one is concentrated and one is dilute. I've been saying that you know, the whole lecture. I mean, which one is the concentrated urine, left or right? Yeah, right, the, the darker color is a concentrated form of the urine. We all know that because we urinate and we see our own urine every day at least. And um, there's a range you know, of um, urine concentration that the kidneys can do. And the formation of concentrated or dilute urine it depends upon ADH, well, and aldosterone too, but it's ADH that targets the collecting duct. So the formation of concentrated or dilute your dilute urine, it depends upon the presence or absence of concentrated urine. Reabsorbed. 
So that's what's shown in this picture here. If you're looking at the collecting duct, there's of course ADH is there and I'm pointing to where water is leaving this tube. Let's, let's remember where we are in the kidney, the medullary pyramid. Because remember, um, when we talked about the loop, which is in the same location, you have that salt gradient, okay? And water entering is like around 100 to 300. And you're forcing that dilute fluid through a salty medium. Normally, the collecting duct is watertight. But with ADH, you've got the aquaporins, which allow water to leave. And because you're forcing it through a salty medium, water will leave by rules of osmosis. So it's really about the presence or absence of ADH. And again, slide presented previously, you're still expected to know it. Know those aquaporins. They're shown here in these storage vesicles, and they're inserted on the luminal side. concentrated urine, ADH is present. For dilute urine, not present. When you have ADH present, you have increased aquaporins. Facilitate water reabsorption. You're going to get the formation of the concentrated urine. Okay. Let's remember that ADH is secreted in response to dehydration, right? response to that, the posterior pituitary will secrete the ADH. If you're overhydrated, you don't need it so much. <coughs> Drink plenty of water and your urine's more clear. <coughs> Here's kind of like um, summary. I have overhydrated no ADH, aquaporins, there's none or decreased. You get dilute urine. So the numbers is large urine output, dilute urine. So as a visual, you know, I, I got my cups of urine here. Pretend each cup represents a liter. Because that, that's kind of like the max output that books report. liters a day. With ADH, you're dehydrated, maybe a half liter a day, something like that. And then the concentration, the number is for dilute urine, 100 milliosmolar. Concentrated urine is 1,200 milliosmolarity. And so the picture kind of helps. At the DCT, you reabsorb water and salt. It's, it's very dilute, around 100. You force it through a watertight <coughs> collecting duct. Even though you're forcing it through a salt medium, the tube itself is watertight. It'll just leave dilute. Okay, large urine volume of dilute urine. However, if uh, aquaporins are present, water leaves, and so you concentrate the filtrate on the way down, especially deeper. The deeper you go, the more water that leaves, especially because you have urea present. Uh, urea is recycled in the medullary interstitial. I'll slide on that. But basically, for the formation of concentrated urine, Urea recycling reinforces it.
urea recycling reinforced uh, by ADH helps to concentrate urine further. So the slide shows you the steps of this recycling. Urea is, is a waste product. A lot of it is in your urine, but some of it <laughs> remains in the um, deep part of the vegetative period. Okay. So the steps are, as it is in the filtrate, it enters the, the ascending limb. Okay. So imagine you're a molecule of urea. You're traveling up here. All right. Now you get to like around here in the cortex, and um, it stays in the nephron because it's <coughs> dilute. So by rules of diffusion, this molecule will stay in the filtrate. But as it goes back down, it gets more concentrated. Deep in the medulla, now highly concentrated, urea leaves because it's just following rules of diffusion. If it's more concentrated, you know, it, just, it just wants to go there. The urea leaves and it forms a pool of urea that recycles back to the thin ascending limb. So basically, it'll leave here and recycle back here. It'll just keep going in, like this in a circle. Because it keeps leaving and entering in this area, it helps contribute to the osmolarity uh, of this region. So that when aquaporins are there, water can leave before it gets to the renal papilla. Uh, all right, so. Last point is uh, ADH in increases urea recycling. So just kind of know that it helps reinforce the concentration of the urine. Um, so some details about the collecting ducts. These cells, there's two the different cell types in here. Okay, there there are cell types that help to concentrate the urine. There are cell types that actually contribute to the acid-base balance. So for the collecting duct cells, look at this picture. Know the principal cells and know the intercalated cells. So, whatever they give the name of a cell, principal cell it's the most numerous, right? Those are the ones with the aquaforms. That's why it says water and sodium balance. I'll just say they have the aquaforms. Yeah, they respond to the ADH, like the slide I showed you. However, the intercalated cells, like cell here or there, stuck in between the principal cells, intercalated. Um, there's a couple of types of those, and they help contribute to the acid-base balance. intercalated cells, there's two types. There's an A, there's a B. Type A intercalated cell, type B intercalated cell. Okay. Um, you know, I actually already taught one of these. I, I taught the A's already. Let's make a connection. Because I already talked about that's the base balance. That's what we make the connection with something previously presented. I'll go back to the slide. To show you what that is, you know, talking about that one. Yeah, this one. Was it this one? Yeah, it was. Yes. Type A, intercalated cell, the collecting duct. It's when I talk the phosphate buffers. Okay, so I'm going to check. <coughs> oh, I've seen this before. Yeah. Check. But the B's I didn't present. 
So that's why I want to make sure I uh, cover that now. So I'm going to go back to where I was. All right, so here's kind of A and B side by side. So as simply as I can put it, the A's pump out the uh, protons on this side and reabsorb the bicarb on the other. There's pumps that accomplish both. Um, so on this side, you're pumping out the hydrogen ion, and this side, you reabsorb bicarb. Always know this is filtrate. And this is blood. Again, start to train your brain. Think about acid-base balance. What does this effect have on the pH of the blood? What's it going to do to the blood here? So you excrete, reabsorb. It should raise the pH. More basic. That's the A's. I already mentioned it. This is the phosphate buffers. You just glob that on to a phosphate, dihydrogen phosphate, and you just excrete it. Now, this one over here, the tiny B's, they, you just rearrange the furniture. You just put the pumps, the channels on the opposite side. So this cell excretes the base and reabsorbs the acid. So now, you're going to excrete the base. I'm pointing out the room on the board here. And it's still blood on this side, and then filtrate on this side. So I can kind of put a line between those, <coughs> so you don't confuse it in your nose. Well, anyways, the type Bs are just doing the opposite. Excrete the base, reabsorb the acid. That would effectively lower the pH. And that's very effective for um, helping to compensate for alkalosis. The pH gets too high. So both cells um, are equipped to balance the pH one way or the other, depending on what the imbalance is. So the concept is, on any picture that I show you, like this one, if you know one side is the filtrate and then you know the other side is the blood, you should be able to answer this question. That's how I defined it. Is it A or B? B is correct. So that's the one thing I have to make clear. It's the test question. This is filtrate, this is blood. And then you can tell because it's all about the uh, pH of the blood. You know, the collecting duct is the last place you can modify the filtrate. And after you do that, you have to send it down to the bladder. So I want to talk about the rest of the urinary system. It's pretty much done with the, with the nephron and the kidney. And uh, the rest of the urinary system kind of looks like this. Professor, how did we deduce that that was a uh, B cell? Just by looking at the picture? Or? B cell excretes the base and reabsorbs the acid. Excrete the base, reabsorb the acid. This picture. Okay. Yeah, that I can't. Yeah, this yeah, I can't tell anything about that. That's just a cross section of a DCT. So this cell is one of those cells. Okay. All right. That is not an effective way to do that. Yeah, I'm not. I don't. I don't follow. Um, oh, what's not an effective way to do that? The bicarbonate buffer is not very effective because it's not making the need. Uh, oh, um, yeah, I said that, but um, that doesn't pertain here. The bicarbonate uh, buffer system. 
you re, re um, you reabsorb the bicarbonate, and you do not excrete the base because it's water to reabsorb it. But that does not pertain to the Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, talk about the bladder. There's the urinary bladder cut open so you can see what it looks like. Uh, there's the ureter. Well, okay, let's kind of get going on here. So when, once um, the kidneys produce the urine and the collecting ducts dump into the calyces, minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, ureter, and you saw it on the kidneys, you get down to the urinary bladder shown here. The ureters descend retroperitoneal and they enter the, the bladder at the base, not the top, the base. Okay, so what you got here is big bladder, urethra, and the ureters come in there. Um, and this one too. Two ureters are right and the left. And that's the ureter. Basically where it empties into the bladder is the ureteric orifice. There's a third point here. Um, it's called the internal urethral sphincter. Let me get a little pen. Okay. Let's see. It's smooth muscle, okay? Um, not skeletal muscle, smooth muscle. Think um, as these three points, the two ureteric orifices and the internal urethral sphincter is forming a triangle. It's known as the bladder trigone. It's, very, it's a very noticeable triangle when you dissect open a bladder. It looks like a water slide to me. You see all these grooves that kind of run down towards the internal urethral sphincter. And um, so basically what we see is that the ureters enter, um, empty the urine at the base of the bladder and the bladder fills bottom up, okay? which is good. I mean, if it kind of emptied from the top, you probably feel drips of urine fill here. That would not be good. Uh, so it fills bottom up. And um, there's another sphincter that you can control with conscious thought. It's within the UG diaphragm. Uh, remember studying the deep transverse perineal in the repro? Within that layer is the external urethral sphincter. So that one is voluntary muscle, it's skeletal muscle. So you have two sphincters to help um, keep urine in the bladder during uh, storage. This is the urethra. So inside the bladder, there, there's a bladder wall. And the, the muscle of the bladder is called detrusor. That's shown on the figure. It's just the muscle of the bladder. 
the detrusor muscle is also a smooth muscle. It's right there. It's just the bladder wall. There, and they, they cut it open right there so you can see the bladder trigone. That's the trucer, it's smooth muscle. The trucer is smooth muscle. So the trucer, internal urethral sphincter, smooth, smooth. The external urethral sphincter, voluntary muscle, skeletal muscle. Okay. Let's remember that the urethra in males has three parts, prostatic, membranous, uh, penile, or spongy urethra, about eight inches long in a male. And um, yeah, what happens is the, the smooth muscles, uh, fibers of the detrusor, as they get close to this orifice, they become the internal urethral sphincter. So, so think of the internal urethral sphincter as an extension of the detrusor that helps keep this closed during storage reflexes. During storage reflexes, as your bladder fills with urine, you just kind of like, you know, you get some just fuller and fuller and fuller. Um, you start to feel it at around 150 ml, around 200. There's afferent signals sent from pelvic nerves. They send these um, what are called afferent volleys. You, you're feeling that your bladder is becoming more full. Send afferent volleys to the CNS. There are stretch, reflect, uh, stretch receptors within the bladder wall that, that send these signals. And as the bladder continues to fill, you know, it gets to 200, it gets to 300, it gets to 400. At around 400, 500 ml, the, the bladder feels uh, full. I remember my anatomy teacher jokingly, I put a bone here. You know, it's like, put, put a person in it, just to illustrate the students that you got a full bladder, and it's time to void your bladder. You know, I'm sure we all had experience on a long bus ride, you're trapped, and they're not going to stop for you, you have to hold it in. And this is where the external sphincter can really help. In the conscious thought, you just hold it in. And these are called the storage reflexes. So, as the bladder continues to fill, these volleys get more intense. And it just becomes harder to hold it in. And some people are better than others at holding it in. Um, if urine dribbles out and reaches proximal urethra, Voiding is eminent. You're just going to go. Okay. You can only hold it for so long. 500 is about the max. Okay. Now, those storage reflexes of holding it in or going, uh, I really do want you to know the details of that. I'll get into it. But I, first, I want to show you at least a female bladder and urethra. And the difference is the urethra is about two to three inches. And a female, um, about eight inches in a male. The shorter length of the urethra makes um, UTIs, bladder infections, um, urinary tract infections, more common in females, simply because the bacteria have a shorter distance to travel to make it up there. However, in both male and female, uh, the, the bladder reflexes. 
storage and voiding are the same. And so I, let's go over the nerves um, of these reflexes. So we have to talk about afferent and efferent again because there's the autonomic nervous system and somatic, uh, somatic nervous system that are basically more nerves for you to know. So let me write them all out here. It's a sensory function, okay? It sends information to the CNS. It helps your brain, tells you, but hey, your bladder is full, you can feel that sensation. And the nerves are pelvic nerves, <laughs> sensory function. What you may have forgotten from 430 is the neuron structure for um, sensory is a unipolar design. neuron like with these specialized processes and the cell body with a single extension, uh, single process coming off of it. So that's a sensory uh, function. Now the efferent division there's somatic autonomic. In the somatic nervous system, know the pudendal nerve. Okay, this is somatic motor. Okay, that nerve in this discussion innervates the external urethral sphincter. That's the one you can control with conscious thought. External urethral sphincter. When you stimulate sphincters, they pucker and they close. So they're going to help keep the urethra closed. Okay? So when the pudendal nerve fires, and your, your brain, you're, you're trying hard to hold it in. It helps stimulate that sphincter. That helps you store, that helps storage reflexes. Simply put, it helps you hold it in if you use it. If you want to go, you have to relax it. Okay. Um, for the autonomic nervous system, well, let's remember for the, um, for the efferent nervous system, the cell body has all these extensions, all these specialized processes. Some are dendrites. It has one long extension, which is the axon that innervates the muscle. We call that a multipolar design for the uh, somatic nervous system. No, this is different for the autonomic. For autonomics, <coughs> You have the preganglionic, you have the postganglionic design. So yeah, it's like you have one cell, and it will like synapse onto another cell. So you definitely had like a, a pre-post ganglionic cell-to-cell -cell communication for the autonomic nervous system. It depends if you're talking about sympathetic or parasympathetic, because they have different functions. The sympathetic nerves in the bladder reflex. Um, are hypogastric nerves, nerves found just below the stomach, hence the name, hypogastric. Hypogastric nerves. Those nerves will innervate smooth muscle, the internal urethral sphincter, and detrusor. Internal urethral sphincter and detrusor. Because the internal urethral <laughs> what, it, what it does is, this is going to help you hold it in. The sympathetic response helps in the storage reflexes. So it's going to, um, for the sphincter, you'll contract I'll put a plus sign for a contract. That helps you hold it in. 
for a detrusor, it's going to inhibit detrusor. So I'll put a minus sign for inhibition. Because that's the muscle of the bladder. You want to inhibit the muscle of the bladder if you're trying to hold it in. They, they pretty much do the inverse. If sympathetic is going to help you hold it in, parasympathetic helps you void your bladder in urination. I'm writing internal urethral sphincter again and detrusor again. And just do the inverse. Inhibit the sphincter, contract detrusor. Put negative sign, plus sign. Just the inverse of the sympathetic response. It's tough memorizing the names of these nerves. Pelvic, pudendal, hypogastric, pelvic splanking. I'm going to flashcard it, uh, just kind of get it in your head. And then study this figure here, where it shows you how the reflex is wired. Study it twice, once for storage, once for voiding. Okay. Um, all right. So for holding it in, call it the storage reflexes, they, they show you slices of central nervous system that are relevant. They show you a slice of the pons. Remember the pons is in the midbrain, it's way up here. So consider it your brain. It's part of the brain stem. They show you a, a part of thoracic or upper lumbar, because remember that's where the sympathetic nerves are, T1 to L2. They show you a slice of sacrospinal nerve because that's where the parasympathetic function is as two, three, four. Okay, so let's remember all that. Pons, um, spinal cord, spinal cord. So um, this is holding it in. Let's, let me kind of outline what you should see from that. So looking at the left, left side there, storage reflexes. Okay, well, um, it starts with a full bladder. There's the internal, there's the external. The internal is, is the, kind of the neck there. They, they draw the external as this kind of board going around it part of the uh, UG diaphragm there. Uh, but anyway, you've got a full bladder. The first thing is you send that those afferent volleys to the central nervous system. So follow this blue nerve. See, it's a unipolar one. They put a little cell body there. And one thing to know is that there's a reflex loop, okay, that helps you hold it in so you, you're caught in it. Right here, that's, that's the loop. We call that the somatic loop. I would say that's the first thing to know for storage reflexes. 
somatic loop. So the loop is um, the pelvic nerve. Let me see if I can get a blue one. Uh, I'll just I'll just try it. The pelvic nerve. It's going to directly synapse onto the pudendal nerve right there. They put a positive sign. Positive means stimulate. You stimulate the pudendal nerve. <coughs> the pudendal nerve has a direct innervation to the external sphincter. Put a plus sign, external urethral sphincter. Okay, so it, it's a loop because you go in, you go out. You go into the CNS, you go out. So this is without conscious thought. It's just helping you hold it in without you thinking of it. If your bladder happens to be really full, this loop can receive conscious input from the brain. Your pond. So look at the look at the top there. There's like a uh, line going down, and it's reinforcing the stimulation of pudendal nerves coming from the pons. Let's just say it's from the brain. Brain input, receiving conscious input from the brain. I'll put another plus sign there. So both of those are like helping you. Uh, to hold it in. Okay, the other thing that's happening is you're using the hypogastric nerve. There's a nerve fiber from the pelvic nerve that's going up. It's synapsing up in the sympathetic region. There's a preganglionic and there's a postganglionic <coughs> hypogastric nerve. And what it's showing you is inhibition of the bladder and stimulation of the internal sphincter. So the pelvic nerve helps to stimulate hypogastric nerve. What they do is, they, again, they stimulate um, the sphincter, but they inhibit the bladder. So it's kind of like they do both. So <clears throat> inhibit the trusor, stimulate the sphincter. I'll put a negative sign the true sir, positive sign, internal urethral sphincter. So a lot of details here, but again, what's the take home message? Are we holding it in or are we voiding? We're holding it in. And so this right here, the plus, negative, plus, make that in your head make sense to you. You contract the sphincters. That helps you hold it in. You inhibit the detrusor muscle, the muscle of the bladder. That helps you hold it in. And that, I think that part's easy to understand if you know what a sphincter does. <coughs> the internal sphincter, think about this. Let's remember also during um, ejaculation, in males, um, that's a sympathetic response. So it's very good for a sympathetic response. You're going to have that contraction. That way, there's no retrograde ejaculation into the bladder, right? That contracts. And whatever urine is in the bladder will stay there. So that's pretty much it for this graph. Any questions? I'm going to talk about this one. Okay, now it's like, okay, hey, I got a full bladder, I'm going to go to the restroom, and we're going to avoid the bladder. And, um,
So voiding, you're going to um, send a signal to the pontine micturition center, and that's, that nerve fiber is going all the way up from the uh, stretch fibers <coughs> here. It's going all the way up. Boom. And I think for voiding the bladder, follow the parasympathetic efferents for voiding. Follow There's three things if you follow them. Number one, if you follow that nerve, the figure does a good job helping you see the three things. There's one thing here. That first efferent is a <coughs> negative sign. So that's an inhibitory response. What you're doing is you're inhibiting the inhibitory. Make sense to you. Inhibit the inhibitory. Because look what that nerve did when it fired. It inhibited um, the, the bladder muscle. So it's like you want to inhibit the nerve that inhibits the bladder muscle. So that's what physiologists say, inhibit the inhibitory. You turn that nerve off. You don't need it. That's the first thing, step one. Turn off hypogastric. Second thing, follow it down here. It's going to um, stimulate pelvic splanchnic nerves. Stem, pelvic, splanchnic nerves. The pelvic splanchnic nerves are the main nerves that help you avoid your bladder. They will stimulate detrusor and inhibit the inhibitory I'm sorry, inhibit the internal urethral sphincter. Let me write that down. So, one, they stimulate detrusor to help you void. Two, they inhibit the internal urethral sphincter. Both of those things will help you void. There's one last thing you have to uh, inhibit. The third thing here, you inhibit pudendal. When you inhibit pudendal, you're inhibiting the external urethral sphincter to help you void. take some rehearsal, but uh, both of those reflexes will, will help you to avoid or hold it in. Any questions on that before I move to my last topic? I'll say the tough part of that is just kind of like remembering the names of the nerves and their function. Once you get that down, it becomes quite easy to understand. All right, so the last topic is a clinical one. It's called sleuthing. And um, I posted an announcement on Canvas about some problems you should practice, because I'm going to give you a couple of these on your exam. And the idea is to use blood values to determine the cause of an acidosis or an alkalosis in your patient. Okay, they present to you and they're having problems with some, certain symptoms. You can look up the symptoms of alkalosis or acidosis, but let, let's pretend it's going to be one or the other. Can you determine the cause? Can you determine if the other system is compensating? And so to kind of like simplify it for students in this class, 
we'll get it down to eight scenarios that you would have to diagnose based on blood values that I give you. So um, if, if you look at this, the eight possible answers to a case that I give you, well, I, there's different permutations you can go through. Look what I have in red and blue. Well, the first thing a student should easily determine is, um, is it alkalosis or acidosis? Okay, so let's title this using blood values to determine the cause of alkalosis, acidosis. Let's remember that the normal range of pH is 7.35, 7.45. And you want to remember this. I, I won't give you normal values. I expect that you know. Well, if you're less than 7.35, which is it? Acidosis or alkalosis? Acidosis. Yeah. And if it's greater than 7.45, it's alkalosis, so that, that's the imbalance for that. That, that determination should be easy, okay? Uh, well, the second thing you gotta do is, we're talking about two systems here, kidneys, lungs, respiratory, renal, okay? Um, what's the cause? If the cause is, it's gonna be one or the other on this exam, if the cause is a respiratory alkalosis or acidosis, respiratory alkalosis. The blood value you want to look at is the partial pressure of CO2. Because let, let's remember our, our equation. We, we've seen it several times now. Carbon dioxide with water with the help of carbonic and hydrates, will form an acid, carbonic acid. It's a weak acid that will partially dissociate and give you an acid, bicarbonate, and a hydrogen ion. So that's why you want to look at CO2, because if you have a lot of CO2, and you push the equation this way, say hypoventilation. Because if you have hypoventilation, you're not breathing off enough CO2. You increase the amount of CO2. Rules of law of mass action say, you got more reactants, push it this way, you get more products, you acidify the blood. I guess the reverse is true too. If you hyperventilate, push it the other way, because now you're decreasing the CO2. If you decrease the products on this side, by default, you increase the um, molecules on this side, you push it the other way. So it can go both ways. All right, so CO2 is important, is an important blood value to look at. So let me give you the normal range for the partial pressure of uh, CO2. The normal range is 35, to 45 millimeters of mercury. So remember that. It's a happy coincidence that the normal <coughs> range of pH is 7.35, 7.45, 35, 45. Okay, it makes it easier to remember that value. So, uh, so basically, say for example, you have a low pH. pH 
7.2. Question. That's the blood value. Acidosis or alkalosis? Acidosis. Okay, I'll just tell you, or let's say it's a respiratory cause. You would expect the PCO2 to be high. Say 46. pH is low, PCO2 is high. Okay, don't just remember that. Well, remember that, but also remember and understand the concept. Why does PCO2 drive the pH down? It's because, for whatever reason, you're accumulating CO2, for whatever reason, and generating more acid drives the pH low. Okay, but again, that's the rule. It's kind of low, but high. If it's a respiratory cause. Okay, blood values come in. And pH seven point six. Is that acidosis or alkalosis? Alkalosis. Now, is that low or high? That number. It's high. That's high. <coughs> Expect the partial pressure of CO2 to be low if it's a respiratory cause, say 30. So you kind of have this opposite thing happening. If it's a respiratory cause, look at CO2. If the pH is low and it's a respiratory cause, that should be high outside the normal range. If the pH is high, that should be low. Okay, that's kind of the rule there. Uh, so that's for respiratory causes. For renal causes, they call it metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. First of all, before I leave the respiratory, any questions on that? A high, low thing, low, high thing. Okay. If it's a renal cause, we call that metabolic alkalosis, acidosis for the renal mechanism. So for that lot value, we just talked about kidney. One of the things kidneys can do is they can excrete and reabsorb base, right, bicarbonate. And so that's the value you want to look at. You want to look at um, concentration of bicarbonate. Now the units are kind of funky. It's milliequivalents per liter. All you got to know is the normal range is 22 to 26, those units, milli equivalents. That's, that's, that's normal. So if it's a metabolic cause, if it's the renal mechanism, say, for example, I'll give you a pH. Uh, That's the blood value, low or high? That's low, so we call that acidosis. However, if it's a metabolic cause, you expect the base value to be low in the blood. Say, for example, 20, low. So it's like low, low, right? You got low base. More acidic, pH low, kind of matches. Um, so the other imbalance will be, say, pH 7.48. That's high. So you expect the base value to be high if it's a metabolic cause. So let's say 20. <coughs> If it's a metabolic cause, base high, pH high. Okay. 
That's why I have a Rome up there as a memory jogger to memorize all this. Respiratory opposite, metabolic equal. Does that make sense now? What do I mean by respiratory opposite? Well, if it's a respiratory cause, if the pH is low, that's high. High, low, or opposite, or inverse. High, low. If it's a metabolic cause, they're equal. What do you mean equal? I mean, I mean low equals low, high equals high. Okay, if it's a metabolic cause. So, you know, that, that really helps. Let's say, for example, for exam. Okay, but that's not it. The last thing you have to do is like you determine the cause, respiratory and metabolic, then you have to ask yourself, is the other system compensating? So you got a low high. Huh. So the lungs are failing the patient. They're, they're causing, maybe they have cystic fibrosis. Um, something where there's an edema and there's impaired gas exchange. Oh man. And this gets high, causing the pace to go down. You ask yourself, oh, okay. Is are the kidneys helping? Because that is failing. Or vice versa, kidney failure. Okay, um, and let's see, you got, I don't know, say high base, you know, so are the lungs helping? Are you changing the breathing rate so you can accumulate or decrease uh, the CO2 to help compensate? So always ask yourself, is the other system compensating? So to put it together, there's a stepwise process that's in your book that I'm going to teach you here. So you can refer to your book if you want. I'll just go through it with you now. So you can put it all together. And of course, in the medical community, there's more than eight possible scenarios here. I just try to keep it simple. I'm telling you for your test, it'll be one of these eight cases. So to put it all together, just follow these steps. Uh. First of all, it's using blood values. So in whatever case I give you, I have to give you the blood values. What I'm not going to give you are the normal ranges, but let's remember what they are. The first step, number one, evaluate the pH. The normal range is 7.35, 7.45. Let's call that step number one. Okay, now, so I'll put the normal range for purposes of teaching today. Step number two, determine the cause. Is it one or the other, and let's just say, let's choose the respiratory to look at first. So consider the blood value, the partial pressure, CO2, the normal range is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Call that step number two. Okay. Well then step number three, look at the other one. The number equivalence of HCO3 The normal range is 22 to 26, call that step three. Okay. Um, so once you've looked at both, you'll, okay, then, then you can kind of step four, make your diagnosis. Which includes 
determining if there's any compensation from the other system. Diagnosis slash compensation. in the form of a question. And I think the best way to do it is just to call that step four. And let me just kind of do a couple with you to kind of like start to train you in how to think about this. Because it's in a serious series of steps, and I think if you follow the steps, you'll be pretty safe. So I have to give you one, two, and three so you can make the determination of four by yourself. Let's say I give you the values of pH, 6.9, 29, 19. Those are the blood values. The pH, the CO2, and the bicarb. So here's, here's the thinking. Okay. Step one is easy. 6.9. Is that high or low? Well, that's low. So is it acidosis or alkalosis? Acidosis. So that's the first thing you've determined, and yay, that part was easy. You've determined it's acidosis. Okay. Move to step two. Evaluate the CO2 value. Is that high or low? It's low. So let's remember. That's <coughs> low. That's low. Now what's our rule again? Respiratory opposite. Metabolic equal. Is it, a, is it a respiratory cause, yes or no? No. No, it's not. Okay. So that's all we say for now. It's not a respiratory cause because it's not the high-low thing. Okay. In fact, it's outside the normal range and it's low, but we'll get back to that. Let's look at the third value. Is that high or low? That's low. So the rule is metabolic equal, low, low, low base, driving the pH down. It's a metabolic cause. So the first thing we can write for number four is metabolic acidosis. And to answer the last thing here, is there compensation? Which system was failing? Kidneys or lungs? Kidneys are failing. Okay? They're the cause. What's the other system? Lungs. Look at the lungs and ask yourself, are the lungs trying to help? Now look, whenever it's outside the normal range, the lungs are trying to help. Think about that. The problem is, um, let's see, the blood is too acidic. So it's like, you, let's breathe off as much CO2 as we can to help bring the pH down, bring the pH back up, I should say. Yeah, so what you're saying is, yes, there's respiratory compensation. So the complete answer is metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. So before you ask any questions, let's do it again. This is best learned by repetition. Okay. Here's the values. 7.2 36.9 20. Let's do this together again. All right, so First value, 7.2, high or low? Low. Second value, the respiratory system, PCO2, 36. High low. It's within the normal range. It's not high or low. So the question you say is, <coughs> is it a respiratory cause? Yes or no? No. No. It is not the cause. Move to number three. Higher or low? Low. Hmm. Low, low. Low base, low pH. It's a metabolic cause. So the first thing we write is metabolic acidosis. The last thing we ask, which system is failing? Kidneys. <coughs> so we ask, are the lungs helping? If the lungs are within the normal range, they ain't helping. So we just say, without respiratory compensation. Without. Okay. 
Okay, I've done two. Okay, at this point, are there any questions? If what's high? Oh. Man, that person's really messed up. No, I'm just kidding. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, what you would say is both systems are failing. Wow, that patient is not doing good. You just can't determine the cause. Okay. I guess the cause would be both, not one or the other. This is what I'm trying to say. When you have multiple organ system failure, you're exponentially closer to death. It's not good. You're probably in the ICU. Maybe you want to start talking about hospice care. It's really not good. Okay. All right, um, let me give you a third one here. 7.25 for you. Three. Okay, you do it. Talk amongst yourselves and see if you can get it. I'll check back in a couple minutes. You can go ahead and talk. You can make noise. It's all right. This is not a quiz. It's not a test. You can talk. It's okay. Trying to compensate for 
acidic conditions. So, with um, renal compensation. With renal compensation. Uh, give me a show of hands. Yeah, I got it. Can not everyone raise their hand? So I'm going to do another one. PCO2 46. High. high. Oh, high low. Okay, lots of CO2 acidifying the blood. It is a respiratory acidosis. Hmm, look at the last body. We're going to ask are the kidneys helping? They're in the normal range. So, no, they're not helping. Without renal compensation. How many need more practice? Nobody. Okay, here, here's what we're going to do. I'm done. Okay? Congratulations to you. You're done with the lecture part of the course. There's just this thing called exams that you have to deal with, right? So let's talk about that. 